Hello and welcome to this episode of Noting Out the Victor, where we delve into the intricate world of technology and its implication on our lives. I'm Victor, your host, and today we have a particular insightful discussion planned for you. Last year, my interest was piqued by the evolving landscape of Web3, particularly around the concept of data sovereignty, the idea that individuals could have ownership and control of their digital data is not just transformative, but increasingly critical in an AI-centric world. Our guest today, Simon, from the company Kin, is at the heart of this. Kin is a company at the forefront of privacy in the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Whether you're deeply involved in the tech industry, interested in the ethics of AI, or simply curious about the future of digital privacy, today's episode promises to be a compelling exploration of these critical issues. Stay with us as we engage in a discussion with Simon, unpacking the challenges and opportunities that lies at the intersection of AI, machine learning, and privacy. Welcome, Simon. Yeah, thanks a lot, Victor, and thanks for having me uh, on your podcast. Super excited to talk a little bit about the personal AI and privacy and kin and everything that's you know around that. Um, about myself, uh, I'm your like classical software engineering. Uh, background from like IT University in, in Copenhagen and always been doing, you know, different tech startups, you know, trying to bootstrap my own companies, uh, a handful, definitely. Uh, most of them failed, right? A, a few that are still alive. Um, but uh, then I realized, I think, uh, during my, you know, bachelor on, on, on ITU actually that, you know, I have been coding since I was I don't know, you know, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, doing websites in Microsoft front page and all, you know, all the stuff, right? Um, and you know, I thought this was, you know, the perfect thing for me in the first year. I too was great, you know, I, you know, I was ahead of of most people. There were, of course, others like me uh, for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then during the second year, where we started to have like really complicated, uh, like mathematics um, and uh, discrete math, uh, really, you know, the deep computer science stuff. Um, I saw that, okay, maybe it's not this, uh, this, it, maybe it's not the like nitty gritty details of the science that gets me turned on. Maybe it's building something yeah. with software. Um, and I think that also came together with seeing people that started, you know, together with me, um, completely blank, no experience, right? And then by the end of those three years, actually overtaking me in their, I would say like, you know, programming skills, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so um, during those years, I started a Danish uh, travel company um, with my cousin actually, who's been in the business for a long time, um, about uh, basically dynamic package, it's called. So you put together like any hotel that you get from APIs, Flights that you get, you know, the same flights from Mondo, packaging it, selling it online. It was kind of new back then. Uh, we kind of started to get, get that off the ground. And I worked on that in the year. Uh, I took a year between my bachelor's and my master's and worked on that. I got that up and, and running. And I decided to take a master's in, uh, in a, like a business IT mix from Copenhagen mm -hmm. Business School, um, which was way less about uh, actually, you know, programming. Um, yeah. And much more about how do you manage software projects? How do you manage like creative people? Um, which was super interesting. Um, yeah. And I learned some new skills. Uh, and then after that, I was like, what, what am I going to do now in that time? Uh, the Danish uh, uh, travel company had actually merged with a Swedish company and split up again. And I had another company that was doing festival management software. That was, you know, I could also go in and do full time in, but I decided to go all in on the on the Swedish travel company and build a team, got it off the ground, went really, really well, um, grew to to quite a big company. You know, it's it's pretty big numbers in the travel industry because you need a lot of revenue yeah. and small profit margins, and it was working really, really good uh, until COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like talking to investment bankers and you know about to finally cash in on like a 10 years journey right yeah. and then suddenly from one day to the next uh, it was like should we just you know go bankrupt and call it a day right because wow. we had to pay back a hundred of millions of of, of krona swedish krona to customers right. money that we already paid 
to you know our suppliers, right? Because we were right. in the end just a middleman. Uh, so that was kind of tough. And I think if we knew that COVID was going to last like you know, two years at least in this industry, we probably would not would have fought through it. But you know, right. luckily we 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 were optimistic and we did. Um, and all is well and it's alive now. But that just made me realize that it's time to try something new. Um, <laughs> And that was uh, then about the time where the whole Web3 space with NFTs and stuff was, you know, taking off. And I've always been interested in, in blockchain technology, mm -hmm. um, more from the technical side than from the investment side of it. And um, But I've always found that it was very much like a closed uh, society in a way, or, you know, it was always, you know, crypto products for crypto people, DeFi, you know, NFTs and stuff like that. It wasn't really something that my sister would be interested in, right? Right. Um, but the technology is so amazing and it enables so many things that we need. Um, so when I saw that uh, Kasper, my, my co-founder and uh, CEO and Ken started to, um, uh, wanted to, to basically build a company together with, with Morph Capital about Web3, they wasn't like exactly sure, but it was like, let's take this new technology and see if we can build something uh, like a real consumer product. Um, and that was two years ago, basically. Mm. And we were on this journey to figure out, um, we started with the technology basically, right. And then trying to find a problem that we could solve with it, which is <laughs> not what you're supposed to do when you're you building around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay. It was, it was very, so it was very research ish and we did a lot of things and we just, don't, we, we were really excited about the data ownership part of it yeah um because what we you know saw back then and all still see is that um the internet is really centered around these giants that hold your data and basically do whatever whatever they want with it right yeah. and it's like that's the exchange that we're used to you you get this product for free um but you know the reason it's free we all know if you're um, not if you're not paying you are the product right Exactly. So like, how can we, how can we turn that around? And, um, from our point of view that required that you were actually able to hold your own data and decide, you know, who gets access and, and, and like have the incentives of sharing your data yourself mm. so that you would get that, you know, benefit of sharing your data instead of someone else getting the benefit of someone else of sharing your data. Um, and we're exploring many, you know, different ways, you know, uh, a, a wallet that, you know, has a private key, like a blockchain a crypto wallet, um, but could then also store uh, data in different formats. So about this, around that time, the uh, World Wide Web Consortium was coming out with new standards around decentralized identifiers yeah. and verifiable credentials, yes. which was kind of big because it was the first time, I think, in like 10 years that um, the consortium was actually bringing like standards from a draft into, you know, a real like finalized version. Um, so it was like, okay, maybe there is something here that's actually going to be part of the internet going forward. Right. It's not just an idea anymore. Um, so we built, you know, identity, what's called an identity wallet where you could store verifiable credentials and, and stuff like that. But it turned out that first of all, no one knows what verifiable credentials are. <laughs> um, and to get, you know, people to understand and businesses to understand that, you know, first of all, we need someone that can issue the verifiable credentials. Yes. And, you know, why should a company issue a verifiable credential? Uh, you know, what's the benefit for them? Then we need the users that need to hold them um, and present them to some verifiers and the whole ecosystem. Do you, want to take a, do, do, sorry, drop. do you want to take a few seconds mm -hmm. and explain uh, what's VCs and just explain the core concept just for people not familiar with what, what that is? Yeah. So uh, a verifiable credential is you can kind of think as it, of it as um, like a credential in the real world or think of it as like a card that's in your wallet that has mm -hmm. some data on it, like your driver's license, for example. You know, it tells something about you. Uh, it could be your know, name and your birthday and stuff like that, but it can also be, you know, uh, some access levels or something. It could be like an, an employee card, but it could also be um, your uh, loyalty card from the coffee shop or something like that. Um, 
And then the idea is that you can have this wallet with these different credentials in it, and you can then go and present it to someone. So for example, I could have my employer credential and I could go and present it, you know, in the taxi, because I know that, you know, the taxi company has uh, some kind of discount thing with my company. Mm. And the, the, the special thing here is that the taxi company would, company would be able to verify that my company actually issued it without going to my company through some kind of API or something. Mm. Um, because of the um, cryptographic signature that is, you know, embedded into the verifiable credential. Now we're back to, you know, private keys, but that my company would, that issued the employer card would have a private key and they would do a signature uh, embedded into my verifiable credential so that I can, when I show my verifiable credential, um, the, the verifiers can just check that signature and see if that is a valid signature. That is a valid employer credential that I have. Mm. No other checks needed. And I believe there's also a concept of being able to prove who you are without disclosing the actual information of that payload as well. Yes. Yes. So that's kind of the, 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 the next step. And what is also supported by at least, let's say, modern verified credentials is you know, zero knowledge proofs. Right. Um, so that is being able to prove something about you without actually showing the underlying data. It's like KYC, for instance. So, uh, or, well, that's maybe a bad example, right. but, but some, yeah. It's some the, the classic example is like you're walking up, you know, to a bar and they ask, you know, to see your ID because they want to know that you're above 18. Mm. Uh, but instead of showing them your actual birth date, you can generate a proof that shows that you are above 18. That's all they right. want to know. And they can then right. verify that proof without getting the actual underlying data, right? Right. Um, okay. And that's, that's cool. Yes. Very cool. Um, so that takes you into then, a hyphen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Long, long, long journey. Uh, so, so we're trying to figure out, can we use this kind of thing? You know, for example, like take your Strava data and then generate some, you know, credentials about, you know, how good you are at running. Like you can run a 5k in less than whatever. And then you could take that and you can go to the shoe store and you could prove that you're a good runner. And because you're a good runner, you might be, you know, a potential really good future customer. So they might want to offer you some discount. Uh, but like this to, to almost like three-sided marketplace that we were trying to establish, uh, very, very hard when it's, you know, it's both like new business, uh, let's say model concepts that are, that are very different from what they're used to. It's new technology. It just, it just didn't, you know, take off at all. But um, we learned a lot about the technology and what you can do with, with uh, cryptography and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then ChatGPT came out. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it took us a few months of, you know, basically using ChatGPT like every day, like everyone else, to realize that what we learned over in what we can call the self sovereign identity space that encapsulates all of the verified credentials, decentralized identifiers and, and all this stuff. Um, solve so many of the problems that we were seeing in the AI world around privacy, around verifiability, and just like trust in general. Mm. Um, and the LLM or the AI, it gave us, uh, it gave us basically a, the opportunity to build a product directly with the user that they would find super interesting because now we could build, you know, an AI that they could engage with directly with their data. Um, and that was kind of, uh, for us, like the perfect combination, we did a demo and everyone was just, uh, that was a demo you saw. Everyone was really, you know, excited, investors, everything. And then it's just like, that was April last year. Um, and then it just, you know, took off. We got, uh, an investment in, in, in August of $1.1 $1 .1, uh, million and, you know, hired some amazing people to our team and just, uh, yeah, it has been like a, a race since then uh, to get something out, um, and now we have the since since uh, December we have uh, like a closed beta. I think we have around two hundred fifty users. You are one of mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Um, in the beta that are you know testing and giving us feedback, and um, it's just uh, it's been an amazing journey, and it's just incredible to see how people are 
engaging and how excited people are about this personal AI future. Mm. Um, Absolutely. So yeah. So, so one thing that, so we chatted sometime in the fall about this and, and one thing that I got super excited about this was this concept of an AI assistant, right? Where, uh, it, well, I should say privacy first AI assistant that uh, back then we spoke by having something running locally uh, that, I mean, my pipe team is essentially having an AI assistant that runs locally on my hardware um, mm. that has access to my contact, my calendar, my messages on all platforms, my email, my bank account statements, credit card statements, but like unlimited yes. access essentially because it never leaves my whole data set. And, and then be able to query that just like I would do with ChatGPT. That, that was like, I, that vision, I, I think is still the long-term vision for, for, for mm. Kin, right? And I think that is super fascinating because once you have that data set and the, that database or LLM, whatever you want to call it, but that mm. enables so many interesting use cases. Do you want to speak a bit more about that? How, what, how you're thinking on the future looks like that? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, when we speak to people about personal AI, you can speak to 10 people and they have 10 different ideas and vision yeah. of, you know, how this should be. Uh, so, and everyone immediately jumps to this crazy feature, uh, future that you also just described, right? Where you yeah. just type this like AGI, like thing that can interact with all your data and other people's agents. And you can plan your hour chat holiday. You can ask, you know, when are uh, Victor available? And we we'll go and find hotels and flights and book everything. It's like, it's going to happen 100%. Yeah. It's just not where it starts. Yeah, of course. Um, so we are, the, a big challenge has, has been to kind of stop talking about that future vision because, you know, we, we really want to get there and we, we believe in it. And, but take it down to some use cases and something that we can build with today that people can get value of today. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what we have been trying to do. Yeah, and I presume having things that runs locally on on your hardware requires pretty beefy hardware to start with. So you would cut out like ninety nine point nine percent of the user base. Uh, so I presume from a pragmatic standpoint, you went down the mobile first route instead because that allows you to attract a much much bigger user base, obviously. And and yeah, yes. So so. Um... So I, maybe I could just like explain what we're trying to build now and then like why we took, you know, that specific local first approach. Yeah. So kind of what, what we're trying to build now, the product is this combination of like, imagine, you know, like a life coach mm. that you have confidentiality with. He's have, you know, he's got some mental frameworks, you know, you trust that he's knowledgeable, knowledgeable in different areas can help you. And also maybe because you went there a few times, he kind of understands how you're thinking and stuff like that. Yeah. And then combine it with a close friend that is always, you know, there to support you, no matter how stupid you are, knows you really well because, you know, 10 years of relationship or whatever. And, you know, it's easy for you guys to relate to each other. Right. Um, yeah. And then combine with this new technology that are the generative AI models that are incredibly knowledgeable. They are non judgmental and they are just always available and there when you need it. We're trying to combine this in into a product that can, you know, help you in, in, in the everyday. Yeah. Because um, I think that, that's a huge difference between ChatGPT, for instance, right, where you have uh, ephemeral chats, essentially. Well, you have threads, I guess. Uh, in They have context, but you have no shared context between them unless you do an, uh, a custom knowledge base in ChatGPT, right, which I've, I've used it quite heavily as well, uh, which I think is mm -hmm. great, but it doesn't have the shared context that you would have in something like Ken, right? Yeah. So if you want to build personal AI, as we see it, there's kind of two uh, pillars for us. There's the privacy part and we can mm -hmm. talk, you know, we'll talk much more about that. Yes. And there's the personal side of it. How do we make it, how do we make it personal? And a big part of the personal is, you know, what people are now calling long-term memory. Right. So if you think about ChatGPT, um, it has memory within that single thread that you're in, right? right. You start a new thread and then it's gone. You know, we call it, you know, short-term memory if you want to put some fancy words to it. Right. How do we build long-term memory where it actually, you know, gets to know you more and more as you go? Um, and that's, that's, that's a, a, a really big part of it. Um, and if, if we're talking about, you know, the, the, 
local first approach then um why do we why do we do this uh, we we're going back then to to looking at the whole privacy ang- angle so we believe that um first of all in the future personal ais are going to be the most valuable digital asset that everyone will own yeah and because of that it must like transcend ecosystem it should not be locked into walled gardens um that's really like our manifest in 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 kin um because like elon musk said a, a few weeks ago um on an interview he said don't take away my friend like imagine that you have built up this let's call it a relationship because that's basically what it is yeah um over many years and it knows you really really well you use it every day you know maybe like your life is you know 10% better because you have this helper that can you know help help you and guide you yeah. and then because you preach some terms that you didn't even read google or whoever is providing the air just takes it away from you right 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 and then suddenly you are you know your life is worse right yeah and all that investment is just gone and we have seen it we know it it happens right it happens with twitter accounts it happens with all kind of things well, so email it's not accounts like a, for gmail as far as a good example email accounts yeah. yeah yeah it's and it's so scary and they don't give us shit really right yeah um so we need an alternative to that um and that's why we need privacy and we need data ownership mm-hmm. and the, the privacy is really and why do we need privacy do people even care about privacy i think that's a big whole discussion yeah. Um, and I think, you know, privacy in itself is not a product. Um, but we also believe, and we can see that with our users that, um, it becomes very tangible when you're sitting there with your AI and you can see everything it knows about you. You get a little bit, you know, freaked out thinking about someone else might access that when it's Facebook and Mita and whatever. In a way, it's a little bit more abstract. You're like, I don't really care. And I'm just, you know, one out of a million. And now you're actually, you know, really going to use it for anything. Um, because you don't see, like, all the data that they have on you, right? It don't, like, surface it to you in a view. But we do that. And we can see, you know, we have asked some of our users, like, if something went wrong, like, oh, can we do, an, like, an export of your data and, and debug? And then they're like, <laughs> uh, no, yeah. <laughs> right? It's so private. Um, and I think that's that's a good point because the reason why I guess I haven't really been too concerned with the privacy element of chat GPT is because there is no long-term memory, so the way you put it, right? It's like, it's just, yeah, yeah sure, there's context about this particular thread, but it's not that sensitive. But if I were to start chucking a lot of personal data in that into an aggregate in a long-term memory, I would be a lot more wary about where that data is processed, how it's processed, and 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 so on, and even where like, where are the data centers sitting? Like, what jurisdiction are the data centers in? All those yep. things become really, really important, right? So let's let's mm. talk a bit about that. Like, what? Let's talk about data sovereignty and uh, data yep. in in kin. Where? So it's a local first approach. So uh, you have an iOS and an Android app. So I presume that's using iCloud storage, presumably on iOS, I would imagine for for the local data set. Uh, actually, not. It's it's completely local. So um, let's see, like where where to begin. I think it's it's um, it's important maybe to understand if you wanna build anything that handles private data and do computations on private data. Um, that is challenging, right? We have, mm-hmm. you know. If you're working with private or encrypted data, you know, you have to encrypt it at rest. That is a problem we know, you know, how to solve. You have to encrypt it in transit. It's also, you know, fairly easy. Yeah. But when it comes to computation, um, that is really, you know, the holy grail. And there's different approaches that you can uh, go to. Um, There's like the, actually the holy grail, fully homomorphic encryption, which is, actually doing computation without decrypting the yeah. data. So doing computations on encrypt, encrypt data. Which is insanely 
it's insane insanely pipe dream, right? yeah. cool and yeah. amazing. And there's actually a lot of uh, uh, work on it in the past few years. So it's really moving. Uh, even on, on machine learning models, but it's still like a thousand times lower than you know, without. So it's it's not really feasible if you want to build, you know, a mainstream application, right? It's very small uh, uh, use cases still. Um, and then you can, uh, then you can do, uh, keep everything local. Like don't send it anywhere, right? 100% local. Um, that's also, you know, th that's a great option if you can do that. It's It's simple. And you know it's it's a it's a really good option. Um, then you have other options like uh, zero knowledge proofs that we just talked about, um, which is more for these kind of uh, one-off proofs. So it's not really a feasible way if it's live data that is updating all the time because it's too heavy to generate all these circuits and, and prove them and so on. Um, and the other way <laughs> is. Uh, confidential computing yeah and um here we're talking about um trusted execution environments you know uh, trusted platform modules whatever uh, the, the names are and yeah uh, to ex briefly explain what it is um it's like an isolated um uh, part of you know different chipsets it's been around for you know on all modern uh, cpus for the past 10 years um they come with like a trusted execution environment and it's 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 like an isolated environment within the CPU that the host cannot access. So usually, if I build an application and I put it on a on a machine or a VM or something like that, um, it loads some data into memory, yeah. and the host environment can do a memory dump of the process and see the data, right? Because it's there in clear text. Yeah. What you get with the trusted execution environment is that you know you get this isolated environment where the, the host cannot actually do a memory dump. And you also get away, so they are born with a private key and public key, of course, from the manufacturer, like from Intel, for example. So it's like put inside the chip, Amazon, whatever, no one knows it further up the, the, the manufacturing or, or supply chain, right? And you only know the, the public key. So what you can do is you can actually encrypt data with the public key and you can send it into the trust execution environment. And you know, the only place that, you know, data can be decrypted is if it reaches inside of that environment. Right. Um, and, and bringing this back yeah. into the mobile world and Apple's been yeah. doing quite good leaps in terms of these things on, on late, later generations, iPhones, both on the cryptographic side of things, but also on the, but also on the computational side of things. How are, how, what's the current state of that right now? Like how much of these models can you run locally? I believe you can run even some, some uh, one of the big LMs, somebody showed they can actually run that on a modern iPhone today. Uh, how yeah. far away are you from able to do all this locally? Um, I would both say quite far, but also mm. quite close. It kind of depends on how you think about it or how, or what you need. So. Um, we, our, our goal is to run as much locally as we want because, mm. you know, it's the safest, it's the fastest cheaper. we have, it's cheaper. You know, people already paid for the computation power, right? They don't have to pay us as well or some cloud. Yeah. Um, but, and, and the devices are, you know, <laughs> amazing. The chips that are in iPhones and, and modern Androids, uh, you can do so much amazing stuff, but the very big models you still can't run there so we kind of had to decide okay well if we want to leverage the biggest and best models which we need because we want to make a good product then we can't only be on your phone mm. we need to have a hybrid solution that can run as much of the phone as possible but also offload some stuff to the cloud when necessary um, okay. but an example of what we actually can do on, on, on the device is, well, first of all, if you want to run machine learning on the device, you also need the data on the device, yes. right? And that's a whole challenge in itself because um, you need a data structure or a database that is highly performant. For us, it's um, 
we are building like a, a graph database. So we wanted to support graph operations, like think Neo 4 a or something like that, right? Uh, then we also need typical like transactional data, SQL-like. Um, mm -hmm. We need support for vector embeddings and you know similarity search algorithms. And then we want to run it <laughs> on a phone. Right. And we want to be able to sync it across devices as well at some point. So the options that you are left with, with those requirements are basically not. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so even like if you could use the cloud or you could pick between any database, uh, you're limited to a few uh, with these requirements. But if you want to run it performantly on, on, on the on the phone, uh, there's really no databases. So we kind of had to pick a database that kind of fulfills some of our requirements and then, you know, build on top of it, integrate it into the mobile, uh, build it so we can ex import it into React Native, all these kind of things and, and work on the sync as well. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, and then when it comes to the machine learning models, um, what we can do is, uh, so for example, right now we're sitting and um, uh, working on an embeddings model, uh, so to do vector embeddings. And if some of you have tried to use uh, OpenAI's uh, ADA embeddings model, um, it's great and it, you know, it's, it's pretty fast. It's like 100 milliseconds if you are, you know, on a decent network connection, right? But if you're out in the metro or something, it might be 200 or 300 milliseconds. Mm. And you do a lot of vector embeddings in these kind of applications, like a lot. Um, so we want to bring a vector model locally and we can actually do that. A model is like, you know, maybe 100 megabyte ish and you can do vector embeddings in five milliseconds. Locally, right. no network round trips, right? Um, and that just enables so much more. You can do so many more embeddings. You can do so many more like searches. Um, so here, like, this is actually something that the user can really feel when it comes to the performance. Yeah, and it's, and it's okay. really important to to get that latency down uh, and get that you know better experience. Absolutely. Um, Talk to me a bit more about. Uh device transfers, right? You say the device the data is local in the device, so it's not synced to iCloud or wherever equivalent on Android. If you were to move the data between devices, then is there a similar model to a uh, signal where you do um, device to device transfer rather than through a cloud service or, or how is that anticipated to be working? Assume you, I, I assume you haven't actually built that out yet, but it's something that you planned out. That is not built out yet, but one of the technologies that we were researching a lot uh, through these two years is um, a technology called decentralized web nodes. Okay. Um, so it's actually a standard that came out of, uh, so we can think of it as a personal database mm -hmm. where you can store your information, data, and it's all um, encrypted with your private key. So you have control of it. You decide who you want to share it to. Um, you can have like shared schemas and protocols. So, you know, if, for example, think of a, uh, a, a music application, like, you know, right. Spotify or something like that. Um, Spotify has all its own data and music and that's great, but it also has my user data, playlists yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And if I go to Apple music and I want to play some music, I sit there and, you know, I have to start over again. Right. Yeah. Um, why should I not have my data? Hmm. Hence, Spotify can have their data, and then we agree on some shared protocols for for the data um, that makes it easy to jump around and use the services that that you want to do. Obviously, there's a lot of you know incentives and all kind of things we can talk about that <laughs> yeah. you know maybe Spotify would not want to do that. But that's kind of the vision of these decentralized web nodes. Um, so this is the web three concept of, of essentially uh, uh, of data portability, right? Yeah, exactly. And and then it's kind of taken to the next step because with Web3, you are very focused on, uh, you have the private key part of it, and of course, that's what enables everything. Yeah. Um, but then it's like NFTs or basically transactions on some blockchain, more or less private or anonymous yeah. or, you know, um, most people kind of mix those two a little bit together. Uh, I mm. think it's very important to to, to separate them. And, but it's not a place to store your, you know, 
conversations, private conversations or your health data or whatever, right? That needs to go somewhere else. And, and that's what this, uh, these decentralized, that's the vision of these decentralized web so, nodes. So it started like, I don't know, five years ago or something like that at Microsoft Research. And then it was kind of taken over by a group that left Microsoft and became uh, TBD, which is a company under Block XYZ, this Jack Dorsey, you know, conglomerate of, of companies. Right. And, you know, it's some very geeky people that are also, you know, super into self sovereign identity and, and ownership and stuff like that, that are building out like the first implementation of the standard. So the standard actually lives at Decentralized Identity Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, but TBD is doing the first implementation of it. Okay. Um, and, you know, we're working with them and, and trying to get that off the ground, but it's still, uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, right. But the promise is amazing. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love the idea of that, right? Because that's, it's kind of the best of both worlds. You, you control your data, but you can still, there is data portability. Like the, the traditional Web3 use case has always been, you buy it a gun in some game, right? And then, well, or something in a game. And then you start another game. He's like, well, I want to bring my own inventory over. I'm not very bullish on that use case, but I am bullish on the fact that I can control my data in, in this, in this concept, right? If that be my preferences for some application or even health data or, or chat data for that sake. Right. I think that's, that's really, really interesting. Okay. So. The other thing I want to chat about, and we've kind of spoken about this already before, is is the whole privacy element around cryptographic identities, because that's a that's a tricky one, right? We all know how to secure properly secure your self hosted crypto with hard of what all that stuff is kind of table stake, but it for some for some yeah. people, <laughs> yeah, correct. I, mean, I, I was gonna get to that, like it, it's table stakes for people who have been around that world for a long time, but mm. for the vast majority. There's a reason why the exchanges exist, right? Uh, because yep. most people do not want to mess around with their own hardware wallets. Uh, and if you do not have a self-governed private key for your data set, be that a uh, some kind of sovereign data, data storage somewhere, um, then you kind of the whole concept kind of void if somebody else controls that key. So you guys yes. opted for a third-party solution for that right now, which is very pragmatic uh, how do you guys how do you guys make that decision how do you think about that and on all those because that's kind of key to the whole privacy debate yes um it's it's a it's a really good question and it's something that we have been you know thinking about a lot i think first of all you have to understand that privacy and security in general is not a binary thing it's not mm-hmm. either you have no security or you have, you know, 100% security. Yeah. It's a scale. And, you know, you can look at, you know, Facebook Messenger versus WhatsApp versus Signal, right? They're yeah. all on the scale. Um, yeah. And you have to decide between, you know, uh, security versus convenience. At least that's been the classic trade-off. Things are happening now that, of course, make, you know, uh, kind of break down some of the barriers a little bit. Um, but our take is that, you know, we could go all in and create something that is, you know, as secure and private as possible. You know, key generation locally on the device, seed phrases under the pillow, the classic stuff, right? Um, but if that lowers the convenience to a point where people are not going to use it, what do we win of that, right? right? Then people stay with big tech because the alternatives are too cumbersome. And then, you know, we win nothing, right? There's like no progress towards that future where we want to go. Yeah, so I mean, we have to have some pragmatic approach to it. The vast majority of people can barely remember their passwords, and if they do remember them, then they probably gonna reuse <laughs> them over twenty different services. Which is why, yeah, have been porn and things like that just like flare up every time there's a leak because yeah, people reuse passwords. So if people can't really even use a password manager to generate passwords uniquely, the faith in them being able to be custodians of their own private keys is slim to nil, right? Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's so much work on this also in the class, you know, in the web three world, right. With account abstraction and all these like social recovery methods and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, we will have more options in the future and we're probably also going to implement some different options and probably also that you can, if you want, connect, you know, your 
existing wallet, MetaMask or whatever, and then, you know, go from there, right? Um, but if I need my sister to sign up tomorrow and start using Kin, that's not, that's not the way to go. Um, and uh, we need yeah. to get to a place where we actually are allowed to survive, yeah. right? Because if we don't get any users, then we can have the best vision in the world, but it doesn't matter. No, I mean, I, I, could, I completely understand uh, the decision that trade-off you guys been making because that makes a lot of sense, right? I, I personally, like, if, if you get to a point where you do chuck all your calendar data, all your emails, all your messages, all your bank statements, like, I personally would not be confident unless I can provide my own private key, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I do also appreciate that I'm an extreme outlier in, in, in the use of <laughs> large, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so... Um, I wanted to, to bring up another thing that we spoke about uh, some months ago, and which I think this is super interesting. Like once you start to build this data set, and you kind of alluded to it before already, is this console of agents. And it kind of dawned on me when we had this conversation about Calendly is a good example of this, uh, where you're mm -hmm. like, well, you can broadcast your calendar, and I can pick a schedule that works for me. That's great, but it's like it's it's kind of a halfway point, right? It's better than two people emailing back and forth, but you are a halfway point. Yeah. What I really found fascinating was this whole concept of agents that can chat to each other without disclosing yes. too much information. And and I think the interesting part there is we can we can definitely deep dive in this, but one of the interesting part here is like it doesn't matter if it takes a thousand messages back and forth to come to a consensus because they can happen over the span of 200 milliseconds or I don't know, a few seconds, right? So let's, I would love to like unpack that and dive into like details on how you guys see that world. Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe that's gonna happen, but it's not gonna happen before we have some trust and verifiability in these interactions. Because like, let's imagine that, you know, you send your AI out to book a table at a restaurant, mm -hmm. right? That's really like, that's a use case that a lot of people bring up in podcasts and stuff like that. And that's great. But how does the restaurant know that it's coming from a real human? Yeah. I, it could be like, you know, an army of air bots that are just out to, you know, book all the tables and right. whatever. Like them. there's yeah. so much that can go wrong. Right. And we, right now you kind of, you, you call and they kind of verify you have a human voice. That's also changing. We have AIs calling now. Well, Google um, kind of proved this proved on <laughs> IO like what five years ago, but yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, but even like booking online, you were like required to sit there, and there's maybe a captcha that checks that maybe there's some, actually something that looks like a human at the computer, right? Yeah. Um, but or if it's AI is communicating yeah. to exactly. Um, so we need a way for the AIs to prove that they're acting on behalf of a human, hmm. um, and that is something that we believe in a lot and, and, and that's where the technology is around decentralized identifiers and verified credentials and signatures and stuff come into play. Right. Um, mm. and then there's the question about how do they communicate to each other? Um, because I think we, we're seeing different concepts kind of emerging. So there's some people that are trying to do like agent communication protocols that are mapping out, you know, different schemas, like you know, this is how they should talk to each other and stuff like that. And I think some of them are taking a little bit more the classical protocol approach that are mapping out a lot of, you know, schemas of how the data should look and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's fine. And that's also what we're very used to from the API, you know, world. Yeah. Um, but now we have this different entity, the LLM, that can actually communicate in plain text, right? Yeah. We don't actually need schemas to do these right. kind of things. Um, so that's, I think, that's really interesting. And I think it's both going to be um, agents that are interacting with each other. But um, one of the use cases that we're also looking at is um, you might want to share some of the data that you have you know, in kin with other people, right? Because data uh, really gets value when it's shared. So we don't want to, you know, there's no point in locking it, it down. That's that's uh, that's wrong. We need to be able to share it and use our data to our advantage. So imagine that, you know, I go to my therapist every two weeks and my therapist could ask my AI, 
to generate a little summary of what happened in Simon's life over the past two years, or right. two, two weeks. Like what physical activities did you do? What interesting conversations did you have together that we can maybe dive into? And, you know, that therapist can just like send a request to my AI in plain text asking, you know, what they want. My AI can, you know, of course, with my permission, mm -hmm. you know, prepare a response. I can approve it or automatically approve that it's sent back. And she can decide what format she wants it in, right? Well, maybe she just wants it, you know, in plain text on an email. Mm. Um, but in another scenario where you're maybe on a website, you know, you want to buy some clothes and the website is like, I would really like to know. You know, what does Simon like? You know, what's his favorite style of clothing? What his you know, sizes? What did he buy, you know, last? So we don't suggest him to buy a winter jacket because, you know, maybe he just bought one or maybe he talked right. about he wanted this. And in, in that case, the websites or the web service could ask, you know, my AI to prepare some data in a JSON schema that they can, you know, interpret automatically, right? And my AI, you know, can do that, you know, because it can do it in any format that you request, right? And that just enables a whole new world of personalization and actually using your data for your advantage, right? Yeah. I find that the, the whole debate about schemas being somewhat redundant is, is super fascinating, right? Because we're so, we're so used to the web paradigm of, of, of schemas and like how you define data and just throwing that out the window is, I mean, it's, it's a big uh, paradigm shift. Uh, in the yeah. way how we interface with data, right? So I find yes. that fascinating. And um, so one, the other thing I wanted to cover is the whole identity piece that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Like you want to book a restaurant, you want well, to prove that you are who you are or whatever. I think in the last few years in crypto in general, we've seen a big push obviously for KYC, for instance, but you always have this massive friction between the OGs of the crypto world where there's a massive libertarian over uh, tone mm -hmm. of like privacy versus uh, the exchanges where they're, well, they're bound by uh, legal requirements for whatever jurisdiction they're in, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that changing? Is, is, is the privacy dead? Is that something that is just going to die out or are we going to see two parallel universes inside of, of this agent world, or if we apply to that? I definitely don't think privacy is, is dead. And I think they're being taken really. So one of the challenges with there's there's many things here, but you know, KYC has always been uh, really cumbersome to go through, right? And then you get this kind of uh, approval that is like very specific to that application that you're using. And then you go to the next application and then you need to do a new KYC. Yeah. Uh, which uh, is really annoying. Um, yes. But what if we could do like we do in the real world and we just rely on some identities or some, you know, credentials that are issued to us by trusted um, issuers like the government issued my, you know, driver's license, for example. And I can use that, you know, for KYC and a lot of different places, right? Because they trust that privacy license. Mm. Um, we see that EU uh, is actually, you know, this year starting to roll out what they call identity wallets. Um, so that's based on verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers. And we are going to have, you know, in demo, we already have, already have like a digital driver's license, but you can't really, you know, use it for anything. You can pull up the app and then you can show it. Mm -hmm. But we're actually going to have these verifiable credentials that can be issued to any wallet that supports the standard. And you can hold that credential and you can use that to prove who you are. And that could be um, also in an agent interaction where you say, okay, my agent is allowed to derive a proof from my driver's license mm -hmm. or basically uh, like present it to um, that destination or that other party and they can verify that this is actually um, a, a transaction that is first of all coming from a human and the human is above 18 or whatever else I want to, I want to check and verify. Right. Yeah. So I think again, the schemas is probably going to be, we will need, you know, some kind of schemas and some standards for doing these kind of exchange exchanges. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's probably a combination of some lightweight schemas that handles these very, you know, verifications and then, 
and how to establish connections and stuff like that. And then exchanges in text format or whatever format that is now the most relevant for that, uh, that exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, the, the KYC stuff is, is even like LinkedIn is doing KYC now. Like you can, you can connect your account to your passport and like, I, I understand why they're doing that because obviously to, to counter fraud accounts and whatnot, but mm. having to upload your passport to LinkedIn doesn't quite feel like kosher to me, <laughs> uh, no, just no, to no. verify my account. Right. Uh, so having yeah. a party like that would definitely work. And I know you mentioned the Danish uh, government is doing digital driver license. I, I think um, bank IDs is, the, is also a thing in Denmark, I believe. Uh, mm. And that's been around in, in Sweden, at least for almost like a decade, I want to say, uh, for yep. accessing all government services and all those things. And do you anticipate these kind of government aid entities being kind of the authority for identity? Or how do you, do you think they have a place to play in, in this kind of realm? I think they have a big place to play because they are, you know, in the end, organizations and entities that mm. we trust and we are used to trusting. Yeah. Um, so what we, what we need is some standards that go you know, cross-border, right, mm. that are global. And that is what EU wants to do now because, let's say, we have experimented, especially in the Nordics with these different... Yeah. Um, digital, you know, identities and verification, stuff like that. But, you know, I had a company in, in Sweden and I couldn't use my Danish, you know, really? uh, NEMID as it was called uh, back then. Now it's called MIDI day because it's a different system. Right. Um, and I couldn't get actually a Swedish one because I was not a Swedish citizen. Right. Right. Um, so I had to rely on like the old, uh, little yellow device where you scan a QR code and you enter some, you know, the, the codes and stuff like that to, to verify. Um, so in order for this to take off, we need these globally adopted standards. And that's what at least EU is pushing out a lot. I know that US is also doing it with um, driver's licenses in, in, in different states. Yeah. So we will have now these, um, like called them credentials or objects that are no longer like bound to a specific ecosystem because it's a, an open standard and everyone can work with these, you know, credentials. And that's just going to enable a lot of creativity, I think, um, and reduce a lot of friction and a lot of interactions. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, it is key. It's uh, finding that balance between revealing privacy. And I think that's being, being able to do a KYC without actually revealing the private data that that would go a long way in, in a lot of these systems and standardizing it. Um, the last thing I want to cover was AI hallucination, which is a real thing, right? What, have you guys seen that? Cause it's obviously, if you use it as a private, a personal assistant, um, those things can be, have pretty significant consequences. How, where's your head around that and, and AI safety at large and, and probably health, health nation is just one of those, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I think hallucinations are, are tricky because you know, you can go, you can go one way and and limit your model so much that it's only using, you know, the data that you provided it. Mm. But then it also becomes much less usable because you want that, you know, full knowledge that it was trained on. And in that span is where you know it's very difficult to 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 not have hallucinations. So what what people try to do is use, it's called retrieval augmented generation. It's like, you know, use that large model and then feed in some data from some data source into it and then try to prompt it or fine tune it to really use that, but still being able to kind of, uh, let's say also pull upon its, its larger knowledge of what it was trained on, right? Um, so the challenge is really mixing those two together with and reducing hallucinations and there's a lot of there's a lot of work on that and you can uh there's many different uh, uh, approaches but it's not a solved problem and i think in general um people have to learn that these llms are a new type of interaction that mm. that you know they have to understand a little bit the technology behind it and that, you know, if it, you know, tells you something, it's not necessarily the 
you know, ground truth, right? That you can rely on. Just yeah. like if some guy on, on the internet writes something, it's not, you can't trust it hundred percent, right? If it yeah. tells you to jump out of a bridge, maybe like reconsider that, <laughs> that thing. But that's, that's a, that's a big challenge when you're trying to make, you know, personal AIs that become so human like. Yeah. but are still not human, right? It's something else. So we have to understand what is this new technology and this new relationship and how do I, you know, use it and not use it. Yeah. I, I think that's that's the hard part, right? Because I I hardcore chat GPT user and use it every day for a lot of things. But and, and quite frequently you do have these hallucinations you like it just gives you something that's played wrong. But it's so convincing yeah. when it tells you it. And you're like, no no, I know for fact that that is wrong. And then it's like you correct it. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm wrong. Uh, yep. So that's yeah. that's obviously a massive one uh, to cover. Um, are you doing like A B? Like I know uh, in GPT four at least they have uh, they give you two responses and you can rate that because I guess that's that's kind of a quasi way to kind of solve that as well indirectly. Yeah, so that's that's another big challenge when you're working with private data. So mm. unlike ChatGPT, we can't just use all the conversations that people have and their feedback on those conversations to yeah. improve our models. Um, and we are brainstorming different ways to kind of get feedback from the user and feed that back into the model without having to necessarily, you know, see the whole conversation. Um, and, you know, maybe we can incentivize people to share some part of their conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, track that we are slowly looking at is can we simulate users on our platform? So imagine that we create, you know, a hundred users that are actually AIs that have maybe learned a lot from some data that we have shared with it about how users are interacting that we can generate. And then we just let these users or these AIs interact with our system every day. And based on the responses here, we kind of, that was a good conversation. That was a bad conversation. That was a good answer. That was a bad answer. So we kind of simulate that data that we need to feed back into the model to uh, to improve it right um so generating fake fake data uh is a, is a big thing so similar to what i bless deep mind was doing in in the early days like having uh ai playing against ai in games but in a different context i guess yes yes exactly uh cool um this has been super interesting simon i'm very happy that i got you on the show here um do you want to do a quick shout out to uh, well to Kin and what people work people can learn more about Kin and and uh, well when you guys are expected to go GA uh, I guess that might not be a hard date yet <laughs> so people yeah. can learn more at least or at least join at the very least join their waitlist absolutely so you can uh, you can go to our website which is mykin.ai and read a little bit more you can sign up for for the beta we're letting in, in people as we go but uh, if you write in the uh, like where did I hear about your field that it was on the um, learning out with Victor podcast. I'll be sure to kind of let you in uh, fast track you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and then I just want to, you know, say that if you are uh, an engineer that are also, you know, considering some of these different concepts, working with them, um, there's very, very few people that are thinking about these kind of things. Um, a lot of software engineers have experience with, uh, let's say now implementing some LLM stuff, but usually it's like go to OpenAI's website, check the docs, integrate an AI, uh, integrate you know the API, and and do a chatbot or something like that. And that's you know we've been trying to hire uh, people, and that's usually the experience. Um, and um, if you want to go like one level deeper, it's the, like the understanding of what can the technology do. You know, we talked about these like different abstractions of agents and agents communicating together. And uh, it's very experimental. There's so many research papers coming out. So if you're one of the people that are actually really interested and really into that, uh, reach out. Um, and yeah, we're looking for bright minds to join us. If I was not busy with other things, I think I would definitely contemplate joining you guys because uh, it is a really cool space you guys are working in. So cool. Thanks. Thanks so much, Simon. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks, Victor. Bye. Bye.